Well, thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you for my, the invitation to address you uh, this afternoon. Uh, uh, of course, the topic is the, uh, the economy and um, I'll focus uh, on BC, but I do want to spend more, most of my time on the Kootenai region and how it's performed over, over time. And then I have actually a second piece of my uh, presentation which relates to uh, typically a very hot topic, housing prices. So I have uh, my views on, on, on the situation, housing prices, and, but, but most of my presentation will be on the, uh, on the economy, particularly the Kootenai region. Uh, clearly, you know, and on a drive up here, Sharon and I were talking about the changes that have occurred uh, in the economy over the past many, uh, many years. Uh, I started as a junior economist uh, all those years ago, <laughs> and uh, uh, the world was much different. The economy is much different uh, then compared to now. Technology, uh, the changes in the uh, global economy, the emerging markets, and, and on it goes. So it's really a, a remarkable difference. And, uh, that those forces have really impacted BC, have impacted the Kootenai region, and still today. And they will continue, obviously, in the future. We, we, we don't live in isolation. Uh, we are integrated with uh, the broader economy, even though uh, uh, geographically we may be quite, uh, quite separate. But the forces are, are quite uh, substantial that affect our lives through the financial markets, through, of course, economic forces, and uh, even, uh, uh, of course, political changes. So uh, generally, I'll start with uh, that material, and then I'll... Uh, I'll drill down to, again, uh, at the end, uh, housing prices and then a quick wrap-up. So uh, let's, let's take a look at the BC economy. So I'm an economist. I'm going to show you graphs. I'm gonna, this is my evidence, okay? So this is what this is. It's a social science, right? So these are the economic numbers. The, these are the data that we work with. This is a graph depicting BC's economic growth rate since 1961. So these are annual numbers. Uh, you can see the fluctuations that have occurred uh, in the BC economy. Of course, that's a reflection of uh, changes that have occurred in commodity markets, export markets, the, the global economy as they may have existed in the 60s and 70s. Look at the large swings that have occurred year to year. Um, and clearly the things have changed. Look at the 60s and 70s, then take a look at the pattern in the 80s, 90s and where we are in the last decade. Things have quietened down. They're not as volatile and, and overall, growth rates are lower now than they were before. Now, to some extent, we're dealing with uh, uh, arithmetical issues, the base effect. Clearly, in 1961, the BC economy was this size, and now it's, uh, it's probably you know, uh, five, 10 times larger. So there's the arithmetic numbers are always going to be a little larger when you're dealing with a smaller base. But that aside, clearly, uh, we're, we are now in, into a different kind of economy in, a, in, in BC than we have been in the past. And much of this uh, can be traced uh, to swings in the economy. Another uh, element is uh, population growth. These are annual population growth numbers uh, through to actually 2012. And look at the swings that have occurred there. And obviously they're tied to uh, the swings in the provincial economy as well. Most of, and all, practically all of the change uh, from year to year will be migration. And in particular, interprovincial migration. You know, the inter international, the immigration component, that's, that does fluctuate, uh, but the, the main cyclical component of the, is interprovincial, and that relates to the performance of our economy relative to other economies in, in uh, the rest of Canada. And of course, there's a natural uh, uh, increase in here, which has been declining, clearly. Uh, demographics are at play. But that just uh, also contributes to some of the volatility in economic growth, which, of course, is... Uh, uh, was present in the previous side. I'm going to focus on the trade sector, exports, the trade sector. And this is, for me, when I look at the BC economy through its various components, the trade sector is what's really been changed over the last four or five decades. Uh, the other components, of course, would be consumer spending, investment spending, government. Uh, but the trade sector is really, and also is really responsible for many of those, much of those swings you saw in the first graph. Not entirely. So here's a depiction of, uh, of trade. I wish, uh, I don't have, uh, data at hand go to 1961. If I did, uh, you would see that the trade balance would be positive and strongly positive. So I'm showing you here exports, imports, and the difference between the two. And adjusted for inflation, okay? So as an economist, we don't want to be misled by inflation. You know, so that we always try to look at things in quote unquote real terms. And when we mean real, we mean adjusted for inflation. That's, to, that's, what, that's how we speak. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> so this is in real terms, in $2,002. And you can see the performance of, uh, of imports have really outpaced exports fairly steadily. We now have a trade deficit. 
and we have had for a number of years. So that means more money is leaving the BC economy than coming in. And that's a loss, that means lower economic growth overall. And that's another one contributing factor to that downshift in growth rates that you saw on the first slide, where the, the 60s and 70s were quite robust, albeit very volatile, but the 80s, 90s, and the last decade were, were more muted in terms of their swings. And, and this would be a, a contributing factor. Uh, we, can, we can break out the trade sector into the international component and the interprovincial. So this is the international component. These are uh, exports of, uh, of goods and services, mostly goods. And here you can see the change. So even in the early part of the 80s, we had trade surplus. And then it started to shift. The diminishing surplus and now a trade deficit. Okay, now if I had, going back to the 60s, you would see that the surplus was even larger, particularly in relative terms. <clears throat> so again, look at the, 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 the yellow line, the imports and exports, and you can see how ex imports have outpaced exports. And exports have kind of flatlined, particularly in, in the, uh, the, the previous decade. And yes, there are swings given the economic cycle, uh, uh, changes in the demand for exports from uh, US and China, et cetera. Here's the interprovincial performance. And this again, 1981. And if I had 1961, which I do, but not on this graph, it would be the same. Mm. So we have a persistent trade deficit with the rest of Canada, period. And that's, that's just the nature of, uh, of our country. So we import, uh, uh, for example, from central Canada, typically manufactured goods, uh, services, financial services, uh, uh, those, those would be the significant components. And we send to them uh, not much. Well, we send to them transportation services, some, some goods, a uh, bit of resources as well, uh, but we've had a persistent trade deficit. And that's, that's gonna continue uh, given the structure of our economy. Uh, we can break it down further in the international side, and this is what I want to focus on, on the goods side. So these are forestry, mining, uh, and other related products, energy and the like. And here you can see that that previous graph on the international goods uh, trade side was mainly a deficit in goods. Uh, the services sector, the international services, kind of plus or minus. But the, the changes really have been on this side, on the goods side. And so we have a... Uh, again, a, a, a significant deficit on the, on the international goods. And the green line is exports, and you can see how it's flatlined. Now, of course, the currency uh, play comes into here. We've had a rising currency ever since 2002. You remember when it was about 65 cents US? Well, we went to parity, we went to a little above parity, and clearly that has had a factor, a role to play in here as well. Uh, certainly in the last uh, number of years. Uh, it's not the only reason though. Uh, I, think the, the, I think when I look back, I see the change has really occurred in the 1980s. And in the 1990s, you could see, you could, it really took, uh, took effect. And that's the changing nature of our, 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 our trading partners. It, happened, it really began, in, uh, if you will, in the, uh, with the J Japanese recession of 1990 and onwards. So we, when we lost the Japanese market, uh, you could see a downshift in our exports of coal forestry products. And that was a, sort of the starting point. And then, of course, we have many other co international uh, competitors for, in resources than we, do to, uh, the, the, you know, than we do today, or than we do now. So uh, that's another contributing uh, uh, factor. Uh, competition from Australia, from uh, South America for mining products, uh, pulp and paper products from some of the tropical countries, and so forth. So, uh, it's, it's a much more competitive landscape. So uh, these emerging markets are, 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 uh, ha have been sources of, uh, of considerable supply of commodities uh, and hence competing for, uh, for our markets. Uh, and that's, uh, that's another uh, reason as well. <clears throat> when you look at the, uh, the makeup of uh, some, some of the key goods sectors, so this is industry GDP, okay? Uh, and I'm focusing on the goods sector. Uh, so this is actual from 1984, uh, annual actual GDP, again, adjusted in real terms. So wood products, so that's mainly, of course, sawmilling activity. And basically, it has, really hasn't changed a lot since 1984. Um, you could draw a flat line through that, couldn't you? Yes, there have been some ups and downs as the U.S. housing market has gone strong and has just turned weak, if you will. Yes, we are exporting more wood products into China, that's true. Uh, Japan used to be a pretty good market and then in the 1990s turned down, uh, so we're not sending much more. Uh, oil and gas, definitely uh, the, the main driver, and that's practically all gas. I mean, we do, the, the amount of oil that we produce is very minuscule, so it's mainly natural gas, and that, i.e., northeastern BC, primarily. Uh, pulp and paper, the blue line down. 
You know, like how many closures of pulp mills have we had in, 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 uh, since the, the 80s? My goodness, uh, I recall when we probably had, what, uh, upwards of uh, a dozen and a half pulp mills operating in BC, and what do we have today, uh, 10 or so? Yeah, it's a big change, big change. And, the, and mining, the red line. <clears throat> uh, Mining kind of hit a wall uh, in, in, 19, in the early 1990s, partly due to, J to Japan's uh, crash. You know, they went through a financial crisis, they went through an economic recession, and then they had uh, what, they, what some describe as the lost decade of the 1990s, and even in the following, uh, they've gone through, what, four recessions? Uh, since the, their great uh, collapse in, in the early 1990s. So it really hasn't been a strong market for us at all, a weak market. So mining, that's coal mining particularly. Uh, yes, we have some you know, copper and, and the like. But, uh, uh, so it's not a very good picture on, on the good side uh, uh, when, you, when you look at it. Uh, uh, How has it affected the regional economies in BC? Well, StatsCan breaks out the BC economy uh, into re basically eight regions. Uh, and this is employment. So what I've done, I've looked at employment. These are annual employment numbers, total employment in these various regions, and I've put them on the same scale. So I had to create an index. Obviously, the lower mainland southwest, which is the yellow line, has what, what two million uh, people, a population of 2.5 million or more, actually. So I, I can't put them on the same scale. I have to index them. And, as a, and so that's why uh, uh, it looks the way it looks. Uh, but the point here is that uh, the lower mainland, which is the yellow line, Thompson Okanagan, the Northeast, they've done fairly well. Uh, Vancouver Island is a red line. That's, that's done okay, although in the last three or four years it's actually declined, right? It peaked out. And then the Kootenai region, kind of in the middle, has really em total employment really has gained a bit, but not a lot. Uh, the caribou. Also, kind of flat line. Yes, there are these swings that occur from time to time, and uh, then of course the northwest, Nachaco region. So Terrace, Kitimat, uh, uh, Smithers, steady decline. Uh, they've gone through a tough two or three ever since the 1990s, when Japan again faded away from their export markets. Uh, uh, they, they've gone through a considerable uh, economic, uh, you know, downturn and. Uh, uh, so that's what it looks like. So this changing, uh, you know, global economy has resulted in, I think, larger economic disparities. I recall uh, in my earlier days when I would uh, travel around uh, BC to look at the housing market and the economy. Uh, my goodness, uh, there was there was stuff happening. <laughs> you know, I'd fly into Prince George or Terrace, and it was, you know, it would be 737 jets. I remember flying into Castlegar, 737 jet, uh, uh, Williams Lake, same thing. I mean, there were a lot of people, a lot of things going on. You know, it was typically resource related. People were moving here as well. Uh, and it was, it was uh, BC was, was chugging along very, very well. And you didn't have this, this kind of performance. Uh, um, uh, but now uh, I think the global economic change and technology, and it's not just about uh, trade partners, uh, it's also other changes as well, uh, uh, contributes to this widening disparity. So it's. Um, it's uh, one thing that's, uh, and it's not, probably not only in, in BC. Uh, my company is now, uh, about four years, we merged with uh, Ontario credit unions. So when I look at the Ontario economy, I see something very similar. When I look at the resource uh, regions in Ontario, northern, northeast, northwest, uh, same kind of pattern. And what, what areas have grown? Toronto. The big, the metro areas. Why? Because their service-based economy is much more diverse. Obviously, less goods-related. Uh, they don't have too many mills uh, uh, going on in there. So uh, that that's a very similar pattern. I'm sure it would play out other ways, except perhaps Alberta. But that's another story. Uh, here's uh, Kootenai uh, employment, like, drilling it down more more precisely. So these are annual numbers, uh, 1996, uh, and then the unemployment rate on the other side. So in the last couple of years, things have, have looked up. Uh, employment has risen in the last couple of years. Unemployment rate has come down. So these are positive signs um, uh, relative to where you were in the, uh, the mid-1990s. Employment is generally, generally higher. So that, uh, that's a good thing. Now, I should uh, also caution you that these economic data uh, are not exactly always precise. So these are StatsCan data uh, from the Labor Force Survey based on a sample, a sample of households. And in the Kootenai region, that sample is on the order of about 200 households, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. only. <laughs> so that means the, mar the standard error of estimate can be quite large. And hence, you, some of the swings that you see could just be noise. 
sample noise. So that's uh, another issue that, uh, you know, this is again a social science. <laughs> uh, we don't have precise, we don't measure it down to the last atom, believe me, so I wish we could. But uh, um, uh, so that some of that uh, issue is, uh, prevails as well. But I think in general, uh, there have been some improvements in the last couple of years, uh, so that, that's, uh, that's positive. And of course, the Great Recession that hit us uh, in 2008, 2009 affected all, all um, most countries, most regions, and that's hence the, the decline that you see there in your numbers as well. When I, when I look at the, uh, uh, any region, uh, I do some basic uh, economic analysis, what's called economic base analysis, and one of those techniques is called location quotients. And for, the, for those of you who are familiar with it or not familiar, basically what it does is compares uh, the various industries in a region relative to uh, a base. Uh, in this case, I've used two bases. One is BC and the other is Canada. So. Uh, that's, that's, and uh, typically what the, basically it measures the proportion uh, of, of the industries that are located um, in, in this region relative to uh, the base. And anything over one on the horizontal axes indicates generally that there's a greater concentration than average and probably is an export industry. Anything less than one is probably not an export oriented industry serving more the domestic market. Uh, and uh, as you can see, for the Kootenai region and both the relative to Canada and BC, it's the goods sector that is your export, typically sector. It's not, no surprise there, obviously. We can break it down by industry on the same basis, BC, Canada. MF stands for manufacturing. Uh, CN is construction. And the other one there's, is actually fishing, forestry, mining, oil and gas. So that's the actual extraction industries. Obviously you don't have much fishing here or oil and gas, so it's mainly F&M, forestry, mining, uh, agriculture. Okay, so relative to, so most of them are over one, uh, particularly the primary, the forestry, mining, uh, and agriculture. Now, I wish I had better data that I could aggregate the uh, forestry, like the wood products processing, in with the forestry extraction. I wish I, and I wish I could do that. Now the trail smelter is in the manufacturing. That's primary metal manufacturing, okay? Uh, so again, it's not no surprise there that the primary uh, resource is good sector. Uh, the agriculture uh, is, is all, not, not, not a huge surprise either. We can do that for the service industries as well. It's a little, little messier because there are more of them. Uh, but on the same basis, uh, uh, and I'll just quickly run down the, uh, the, the vertical axes. The, the trade sector, so it's retail, wholesale trade, transportation and warehousing, finance, insurance and real estate, professional, scientific and technical services, uh, business and building support services, education, health, information, culture, recreation, accommodation, food. Other services, personal services, uh, uh, dry cleaning, haircuts, the, the rest of it. And then public administration, government. So of those, only the accommodation food is, seems to be an export-oriented industry on the services side. Um, so that's perhaps no surprise either. That, so you have primary resources and tourism. That would be your export drivers. Uh, and exports generate, you know, bring in income from the outside. That's why they're so important and they increase overall economic activity. I mean, you can have an economy based on domestic services uh, industry. That's fine too, but don't expect it to grow a lot. Okay, and probably more stable, which could be good. Uh, but you, we won't see a lot of, you wouldn't see a lot of extra growth. Yeah, so it's mainly from, the, from exports. We can also t take this analysis further and do something called shift share analysis and that attempts to, to identify sources of growth. Okay, this is a rough cut. It's just a, just a very rough cut. And again, relative to BC and relative to Canada. And so what this attempts to do is to measure to what extent are the growth in the various industries, all those 16, 18 industries I showed you earlier, due to uh, the same growth rates in BC and Canada. Okay, that's what that macro share says. So uh, the, the factors are on the vertical and on the horizontal are, is the overall growth in, in, in employment, in, not in persons, per, in thousands. And when I'm, because the sample is kind of volatile, I'm taking a three-year average, 95 to 97 as my starting point, and I'm comparing it to the three-year average, 2010 and 2012, just to, just to stabilize the numbers, if you will. Uh, so it's not technically 95 to 2012 per se, it's the averages, okay? Uh, 
And it's, so it's the, the overall change in employment based on that three year average starting and ending is only, it's practically zero. It's actually minus point uh, something, uh, 800 I think it is. So it's practically zero. So uh, we're going to allocate the growth uh, that has, such as it is. So the macro share, the BC and Canada have grown, so you'd expect everything to grow as well, right? And uh, that seems to be the main driver of Kootenai growth in, during this time period. You look at the industry mix. To what extent has the Kootenai region have industries that are actually growing faster than industries, the same industries in BC and Canada? So if you have overall your composition of industries uh, is, is actually you have more faster growing industries than BC Canada, that would be a positive number, okay? But it's, it's roughly zero, so it's kind of a wash. Um, the, the real interesting one is the last one. This is the, the, what's called the local effect or the regional effect. So that's kind of like a residual. After you've accounted for the first two, uh, this is kind of left over. And this is the more, most important one. And this is the, it's kind of a measure of to what extent is, is the local or, or the regional economy actually gaining or losing in comparative advantage. And based on this simple analysis, it's, it's lost. Okay, so the growth that you have experienced, uh, you would have experienced because overall growth in BC, Canada, all those drivers basically account for, for the growth. And, and your regional economy, for whatever reason, it doesn't tell you why, obviously. Uh, could be cost structure, could be just uh, uh, the nature of, uh, uh, well, obviously the industries to some extent uh, um, that you just results in, uh, in, in this kind of uh, outcome. So. Uh, overall, the Kootenai region, and other regions too, by the way, when I, I've done this for all regions in BC, all regions in Ontario, and I see a similar pattern in northern Ontario and in other B, uh, northern, you know, rural-based or resource-based regions in BC. The ones that have positive, no surprise, Toronto, Vancouver, <laughs> okay, they're the ones that have the positive regional effect, yeah. Uh, just looking at some of the other economic numbers for available for the Kootenai region, this is uh, our business incorporations uh, for the three regional districts. So the East Kootenai, uh, Central Kootenai, and the Kootenai boundary. So just to give you a sense, uh, it's another measure of economic activity. Obviously, uh, if you have more business startups, that's typically associated with better economic times and, and vice versa. So uh, that's, that's what it looks like. Of course, you can see the surge that occurred uh, you know, prior to the recession of 2009, uh, you know, roughly 2004 onwards. It was a pretty good time, right, uh, uh, where, where growth occurred. Uh, this is population in the Kootenai region uh, on the two basis, I'm using two scales. One is total population, the blue line on this side, and then the, the growth rate, the change on, on the other scale. So clearly there was a population loss from the uh, late 90s into the early uh, part of the uh, last decade, and then uh, subsequent reversal. Again, those better economic times that you saw from the business and corporations data, and from the previous one on, on labor market. Obviously it's all related uh, on the employment numbers. Uh, the components of growth, uh, perhaps no surprise, the real swing factor is, is interprovincial migration. It's really migration. Uh, so here are the four components of growth. Uh, the blue line is net interprovincial. So that's the flows uh, between provinces to this region. So how many people leave, how many people come here from other provinces. So that's the big swing. As you can tell, it was negative, turned positive, and now it's gone back negative, as it has with other regions in BC, by the way. In fact, the fourth quarter number just came out uh, a couple days ago, and uh, it, it suggested that it, it was ongoing, uh, ongoing out-migration for the province as a whole to other provinces. So we're losing people to Alberta, Saskatchewan. We still gain from Ontario, the Maritimes uh, to some extent, but we lo we're losing uh, uh, to Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, the yellow line is net international, and then net natural, that's births minus deaths. <clears throat> and then the intra-provincial, that's the movement of people within province to here, and people who leave this region go to the lower mainland or, 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 or the Okanagan, if you will. So it's, it's that flow as well. And those latter two, the interprovincial and intra-provincial, are, are more economically sensitive uh, components, and hence you have these, uh, these larger swings. 
this is what population growth looks like for the three uh, economic or three uh, regional districts, pretty closely correlated. Uh, Kootenay, Brown, Kootenay boundary, and that's a somewhat of an underperformer. You can see there it's kind of lagged behind uh, on the upswing, a little deeper on the downswing. Uh, uh, but the East Kootenay and Central Kootenay uh, have, have gained uh, um, uh, and have held their population uh, gains, uh, whereas the Kootenay boundary is kind of uh, hovering uh, plus or minus. And the Kootenay Brownie, when I look at the components of growth, ha has a very uh, significant outflow, a net, in, net natural, uh, is actually a net natural decrease. So they have far more uh, you know, uh, deaths than, than births. So they, that green line I showed you earlier is actually quite negative for the Kootenay Boundary region, you know, just as an aside. Uh, housing sales, the housing market. So here's the housing uh, sales since 1976 <clears throat> on an annual basis. And the other graph is the median sale price. And this comes from the land titles, so this is not MLS, so these are, are, are good, good clean sales, if you will, market transactions only, and uh, uh, so MLS and non-MLS, and you can see if the, how the housing cycle has played out over, over the uh, three and a half decades, uh, how prices have played out as well. And lately, of course, we're in a downside of the cycle. Uh, prices have softened, uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, the housing is typically one of your more cyclical sectors, clearly. Uh, just turning to some other uh, sectors, these are non-residential building permits. For the region as a whole, broken down into public, uh, that's uh, schools, hospitals, industrial and commercial. So again, you saw, saw some surge there, particularly on the government side in the uh, 2004, 2006, 7, and it's kind of quietened down. And, not, not too much happening there. I mean, it's kind of chugging along. Uh, when you look at the major projects, what, what might be coming down the road for the Kootenai region? Uh, one uh, indicator could be from the uh, major projects inventory. These are, uh, this is a report produced uh, quarterly by the BC government. So uh, the various uh, projects, these are projects of $15 million or more. And I've got them for the past five quarters, ending to the fourth quarter, 2012. And these are in millions of dollars. So there are uh, two, uh, in terms of proposed projects, uh, $2.1 billion worth of proposed projects. Uh, uh, 3.8 billion have already been started. And uh, there are 1.655 billion on hold. And you can see how it's performed over time and giving you a total. Um, so that's, you know, they're not pretty good numbers. Here's, here's what the fourth quarter looks like by industry. So we can break down each project and categorize it. Uh, and uh, resorts aren't really an industry. StatScan doesn't <laughs> have an industry called resorts, but I just termed it that. It's really, a, it's a combination of accommodation, obviously, some real estate. Uh, uh, but they're class, they're in the inventory, they're, they're, they're called resorts. So that's the big sector, obviously. Uh, and the Jumbo Glacier uh, is, is in there now. So that, that showed up in the fourth quarter. So, and of course, many of these proposed projects are what, 10, 20 year time horizons, potentially more. Uh, so uh, we, could, we'll, we could see them on that proposed list for, for quite some time before they actually um, get it. And even when they're started, you know, they, they could, be a, it could be a 10, 20 year uh, build out. Uh, I mean, Red Mountain is in, is in the uh, started c category and it's still going, right? It's, it's got a long way to go. So you gotta, you know, these numbers are, um, a bit, uh, uh, you, have, you have to understand what they're about. Uh, manufacturing, uh, utilities, of course, is another one. Of course, the various uh, major, uh, you know, major hydroelectric projects, uh, the upgrades that have gone uh, underway and, uh, and the like, that's another uh, component. But it's really the resorts, uh, utilities, the mine. There's a new mine that came on the uh, projects. It was called the Bingay Creek Mine, I believe. Again, these are all southeastern uh, 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 BC coal coal mine related, and of course the headline in the Sun was what uh, with the uh, with the pollution pollutants that are going at the river. Uh, uh, perhaps these these new mining projects may be delayed for for some time, but there are a number that are proposed uh, to 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 occur there. We'll see if they actually play out or not. Uh, the manufacturing side, uh, uh, there's a, a the odd small sawmill and that kind of thing that has uh, it's in in the works, but uh, it's. Uh, uh, and one of those proposed is the, um, uh, in the uh, Kaminko, the, tech, the smelter. It's uh, something to do with one of those lines that are, uh, uh, pot lines that are something that are going to uh, be uh, potentially changed. 
How, to what extent might these projects uh, materialize? Well, uh, of course, we'll look to, uh, these are export-oriented projects, so I'm going to look to the export market. Um, what, what's the price of coal? You know, uh, to what extent, if it's rising, well then that obviously increases the likelihood that we could see some of these mines uh, expand or new mines actually commence. Uh, this is a net coal price, uh, uh, the actual history and the forecast for 13, 14, and 15. So it looks like it's, uh, you know, uh, going to hold up. But bear in mind, trying to accurately predict commodity prices is, <laughs> is difficult. Uh, you can, the, all those swings you see were not predicted. Uh, typically, con you know, futures markets, uh, forecasters, we, you know, we tend to predict on trend. So hence the smooth line uh, out there. And no doubt the real world will actually uh, turn out to be something quite different than that. But, uh, you know, with, with uh, the re global recovery generally underway, it's all obviously operating at a, at a lower level than we would like to see, but uh, there are signs that China is beginning to perk up. Even Japan is, uh, has implemented some new policies. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, one could think that over the coming uh, uh, couple of years, there should be some, some better growth uh, from those uh, economies and, uh, and also uh, contribute to some, some better uh, commodity prices. Uh, housing starts, or what might lumber prices do? Well, U.S. housing starts are on the upswing. Uh, the recovery uh, is, is, I think, well entrenched. Uh, I'm referring to the housing recovery. And even the U.S. economic recovery. It's now, uh, we're well into year four of the economic recovery. In fact, coming into July to, uh, 2013, we'll be commencing year five. And yes, the recovery was, was uh, unusual. It's been unlike any other recovery we've seen in the post-war era. Uh, but now, it's beginning to look like almost a normal recovery, what you'd normally would expect to see coming out of a recession. But because the last recession was so unusual with the financial crisis, the crash in the U.S. housing market, uh, you know, we haven't seen that before. And that's really caused uh, this result in this really modest, moderate recovery, 2% growth rates for the past, you know, what, four years now. Yes, there have been some swings, a little bit above, a little bit below, uh, but it's been around there, and that's, and that's never happened before. What we normally see uh, coming out of an economic recession is, is uh, as interest rates come down to stimulate growth, we see the consumer sector uh, come up, uh, sp you know, pick up uh, consumer spending on durables and particularly housing. They typically lead the recovery and now it's finally beginning to happen. Uh, so we're, we're uh, so I think, becoming, uh, uh, it's going to be a little, hopefully a little bit easier to, to predict <laughs> the future if it, if it turns out to be a little more what uh, the past has been like. Uh, these forecasts for housing starts, are, I think, are reasonable. Uh, you know, housing starts hit record lows, 500,000 units. That's uh, the lowest on, uh, you know, on the available record. Uh, very weak uh, initial year or two, and now it's starting to perk up. Uh, we had almost 800,000 units last year. Uh, expectations are somewhere around a million this year. Next year, somewhere around maybe 1.2 million. So that should, uh, and already has, lifted lumber prices. Lumber prices are now on the order of $450, $500 for 1,000 board feet. I can, you can go back when it was 225 bucks. Big difference, huge difference. And uh, these are forecasts on, on the lumber price as well. Uh, uh, that, and these are just annual averages, but uh, we're, we're going to see some uh, pretty good uh, increases in, in lumber prices. Uh, and we were just talking on the drive here. Uh, another longer term factor is the pine beetle infestation. And the amount of timber supply that we've, we're going to lose is, is, very, is significant. And how are we going to supply the mar U.S. market when it hits 1.5 million? And maybe in five years, two million, or, or you know, back to normal, quote unquote. You know, uh, it won't be from our supply. So, uh, in, in, I think in the medium term, you can expect lumber prices to increase. Now, of course, the way markets operate, other sources of supply will come on stream. So, uh, you know, you can bet the Russians and, and others, other sources of supply that uh, will will inc step up production, inc expand, uh, and to fill the fill the need. But we won't be able to fill it. Not to the same. You know, we're going to lose. Uh, a considerable portion of our timber supply. I mean, it's, it's probably on the order of 30, 40 percent. I mean, it's, it's major. And of course, it takes, what, 50, 60 years to regrow. So uh, this is going to be a big hole in our resource, uh, in our lumber, uh, lumber economy in BC. <coughs> uh, on the tourism resort side, uh, what kind of sort of indicators might you look at as to, uh, as to the, the future of that sector? Now, I, I've chosen uh, Alberta because it's 
typically a lot of these resort developments are in, this, are in East Kootenai region, so neighboring Alberta. And given that, uh, you know, we have seen when Alberta perks up, uh, when their economy is doing well, when their housing market is doing well, Albertans tend to uh, buy uh, recreational second homes, uh, etc. So here's a measure of economic activity in Alberta, uh, labor income, just as we look how it turned upwards in 2003, 4, 7, and of course the crash came, and now it's kind of at moderate levels, and, and of course uh, similar to employment. Here's the Alberta housing market. Of course it too had a nice surge in, uh, in the previous uh, decade, and it has since, uh, you know, turned down, and uh, the, look at the housing prices in Alberta, they've basically flatlined uh, as well. And these are annual numbers. If you look at the monthly numbers, Alberta's actually softened over the past several months, uh, as we've seen in BC and Canada as a whole. So I would say based on this that, you know, the Alberta market isn't going to be supplying much in a way or in, in vacation resort rental demand anytime soon. Uh, typically, the demand for that type of product it comes well after uh, the recovery, uh, the economy picks up and, 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 and operates at a higher level. After all, it is a discretionary uh, expenditure, uh, not a necessity like, uh, like ownership housing. So I'll just wrap up with that and uh, say that basically, you know, that the BC's trades, uh, trades performance has, has deteriorated. Uh, um, and I, you know, I mentioned about the currency as well. That's certainly a factor. But, uh, uh, you know, it basically comes down to our cost structure, the increased competition from other, other sources uh, as well. Uh, and, uh, um, of course, and the other comments that I've made here, I think, uh, I'll end up with the last one. Your, your long-term outlook depends on, on many factors. Now, that's an insightful comment, isn't it? <laughs> so I'll leave it kind of open-ended. Uh, in, in the medium term, I, th I think it's uh, lumber outlook's good. You know, the mining, I think, uh, will eventually come around. I think we will see some expansion. That's probably uh, two to four years out. And then the resort sector, again, I would put uh, three to five, six years out, quite frankly, before we see meaningful, uh, you know, uh, pickup in that sector. It'll come, uh, but it'll take some. It'll take some time. Now I'll turn to housing, one of my f one of my favorite topics, since I was. Uh, uh, cut my teeth in housing, if you will, way back when. I started with CMHC uh, as a junior economist way back when. And so I've been following the housing market for many years. <clears throat> and you often hear, uh, you know, the housing prices, they're very high, uh, particularly in, in uh, uh, not just BC, but the lower mainland. Uh, uh, they're they're uh, at such high levels, uh, unsustainable. We're in, a, we're in a bubble. Uh, prices have to come down because because it's unsustainable, it's in the bubble, uh, et cetera. And so that's really, a, uh, you know, it seems to be a common perception out there. Uh, and I would classify it as it's turned into a myth, quite frankly, a common, you know, it's really, a, it's, it's, it's misunderstood as well, I think. Yes, prices are high, there's, that's, there's no mistaking that. And I'm showing you here prices since 1976. I'm showing you two measures. One is the median sale price and one is the average. I just want to make the point here that most of the prices you see quoted and reported on is the average, okay? And uh, the average is skewed by those high-end properties, whether it's, uh, you know, those uh, the high-end uh, penthouses or single-family homes on the west side of Vancouver. That'll lift up the average. Uh, um, and a better measure indication is the median, right? The midpoint of all the sales that occur in any particular time period. So, so 500,000 versus 700,000, big difference. But of course, most of the attention is on the 700,000, if not more. And most of the attention is on West Side Vancouver, where, where you, it'll cost you $2 million for a teardown house, right? That's all the attention. It's, why? Because it's, it, it's, it's so different, right? It's, it's so out there. You know, a man bites dog, or dog bites man is not news, but man bites dog is news, right? So the out of the ordinary is, is newsworthy. So that's what gets reported. And it also gets worked into the analyses. You know, I see many reports and analyses that focus on the average. Now, granted, the median isn't readily available. I have this through Landcore Data Corp, and it's, and it's not readily available. But whereas the average is published from the real estate boards, it's in newspapers, so it's easily to obtain, so it's easily used. But it's, again, not the ideal measure, clearly, particularly for housing distribu sales distribution. And of course, here we go. So you use that average uh, and you, you compare it to incomes. And so what do you get? Well, of course you get very high price to income ratios. Uh, this is my, my construct of, of the, inf of the uh, measure. I'm using, again, Metro Vancouver. And uh, I'm using a, a, a different income measure. 
than you might see. I'm using non-elderly family income because I think that's more representative of, of, uh, of an income basket that would be a home purchaser, right? Because after all, what is the price to income ratio? It is only, a, a, it's an affordability metric, right? That's all it is, price to income. So it's, an, it's one of those affordability metrics. <clears throat> it's not a valuation metric. And that's what a lot of people use it for. A lot of analysts use it as a valuation metric. They say the price to income ratio is so high that it's overvalued, it's, it's uh, unsustainable, and hence prices have to come down. Well, that's a misuse of this metric. It's, it's simply affordability. It's not valuation. And there are other, uh, other ways to attempt to estimate the fundamental value of, of, of housing. Uh, this is not it. You wouldn't use this. Uh, and you can see this general updrift. That's all driven by prices, of course. Incomes have not kept pace uh, in BC or in Canada with, with, uh, with housing prices. That's true. And uh, there was another report, in fact, uh, that came out uh, month, within a month ago. It's that report for uh, Demographia. Have you heard of that one? Uh, out of New Zealand. And so it comes out annually. And it uses uh, a Vancouver average price. And its uh, ratio, it uses a different income measure. It uses income for all households, you know, old, young, renter, owner. And so its price to income ratio was almost 10. And in the last year's, previous year's report, it was 11. So it was the second highest of all the 350 cities it covered, okay? So Vancouver was number two on the list as the least affordable or most expensive. And so that gets reported. And I saw reports uh, subsequently saying that Metro Van Vancouver is the second most expensive area in the world in the world, on the planet. Well, guess what? That report covered seven countries, <laughs> okay? <laughs> seven, <laughs> not 185 and counting, okay? So it's not the planet, it's not the world. And that mis misinformation gets repeated. I just read it again in Barbara Yaffe's article, a column, where, she's, where she was writing a nice piece on housing, which is all good, and she said, oh, Vancouver's the second most expensive place on the, on the planet. <laughs> Repeating what she had heard or read before, never mind bothering to check, <laughs> you know. So, and so it goes, right? I'm telling you. When it comes to housing, people just sort of, don't, you know, just sort of go off on this uh, tangent sometimes. Uh, so uh, we're not the most, second most expensive on the planet by any stretch. Uh, yes, we're the most, second most expensive on that list, uh, but I would take some, 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 some I would have some uh, exceptions to the way he calculates his price to income ratio, but that, that being said, that's, not a, that's just the way it is. But there are many other factors that come into play. I said, well, why are prices the way they are? You know, and yes, the income is one de demand determinant. And other studies uh, uh, look at, uh, in addition to income, they'll look at oh, demographics, they may look at the financing and mortgage rates, uh, and uh, then they also conclude in their quantitative analysis that housing is overvalued in Canada, BC, Vancouver in particular, even Toronto as well. Um, uh, IMF came out with a study in 2008, they, they revised it, updated it in 2010, same conclusion. Uh, that uh, prices are in Vancouver are, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 percent, 25 percent above uh, fundamental value. Well, how do you determine fundamental value? Well, there are a number of ways uh, being attempted. Um, uh, basically, it comes down to what? Demand and supply, okay? So this is all demand driven, and, the, the, and what I told you before is all demand side driven. And none of these analyses take into account supply, supply side factors. Economics 101, Remember that? Demand and supply determines price. So if you're only looking at price to income and those other variables I mentioned, that assumes that supply doesn't play into price. It's perfectly elastic supply curve. It's flat. Well, it's not, believe me. So let's take a look at, at one important supply factor, land. How about that? So here's uh, the four metropolitan areas in Canada I've chosen. And this is the, their land area as of the 1981 census and the 2011 census. So this is the land area from, uh, from StatScan. So Calgary in 1981 was, was 500 square kilometers. 10 year, and 30 years later, it was 5,000, increased tenfold. 
So Calgary can grow in all four directions, if you've ever been to Calgary. Toronto increased to uh, about 60%, almost 6,000 square kilometers. It's huge, right? It can grow in three directions, Lake Ontario being <laughs> not possible. <laughs> so it can grow in three directions. Victoria, uh, obviously much smaller. Uh, it can grow in, I would say, I'll give it two directions. North is limiting mountains, but it's mainly to the west, right? But even there, it's going to run into what? Pacific Ocean. <laughs> okay, so it grew, uh, you know, look at Metro Vancouver. Hardly changed. There was a little technical, you know, a little bit of addition there, 100 square kilometers. It's under 2,900 square kilometers in total. And it hasn't, and in 30 years, so it hasn't changed. So this is what it looks like. This is a map of Metro Vancouver, okay? So uh, of that 2,900 square kilometers, uh, what you have there are mountains to the north, water to the west, U.S. border to the south. So it can grow in one direction. We'll, we won't count up, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I'm talking compass here, <laughs> two-dimensional, <laughs> okay? So, and look at the, the, the mountainous region. That's called electoral area A. You know, that's Bowen Island, Cyprus, Grouse, Seymour, the Capilano Watershed, uh, Burke Mountain, Golden Ears, 800 plus square kilometers. Uninhab undevelopable. The shaded area is the agricultural land reserve. 600, a little over 600 square kilometers. And yes, they are chipping away at it and there's some development occurring. Then you have Burns Bogs, Stanley Park and other such uh, areas. You have less than half of those 2,900 square kilometers available for urban development, right? 800, 600, throw in a few others. You only have 2,900 to begin with. And uh, so you only, you have less than that half available for urban development, okay? So that, and you know, it's, it's likely that uh, uh, you know, that has an impact on prices. What do you think? Population. <clears throat> 1981 was, uh, 19, and 2011 census increased by one million persons. Okay, so we're about just, this is Metro Vancouver, so we're about 2.3, I think it is, in 2011. Uh, projections from BC Stats in, in, in the next 25 years, 2036, it'll increase by about 900,000. Now that depends on your immigration assumption, your migration, maybe it's only gonna be 800, maybe it'll be a million, who, who, you know, it's, it's a projection. <laughs> uh, but it's certainly uh, in that direction. And guess what? That growth will have to be accommodated in the same 2,900 square kilometers. It's not growing, okay? This is the population density from each census from 1976, okay? Uh, so these are five-year increments. And this is a, based on the entire 2,900 square kilometers. But effectively, if half of that's not available for, for development, you could double that, right? Basically, it shifts up by a factor of, uh, of, of two. Uh, so today, we're about, uh, well, 2011, 800 some odd persons per square kilometer. In uh, 2036, if that projection is reasonable, it's going to be approaching 1,200 persons per square kilometer. So which way do you think land prices might go? Well, we can, we can estimate something. So the, uh, here we go. We can use population density. And uh, what's the relationship between that and prices? So the red line are the actual median sale price every five years, because as, as of every five-year five census. And then I, I relate that in statistically, a very simple equation, to population density, the yellow line. And since I know what the forecast is based on the population, and I know Metro Vancouver is, is not going to be expanding, we're not going to be moving mountains, we're not going to fill in the Salish Sea, it used to be called the Strait of Georgia, and we sure as heck aren't going to be annexing Whatcom County. <laughs> Last time I looked, the U.S. military is a little bit larger than the Canadian military, I think. So we're stuck in, the, in that same little box, right? We're only going to go east and we're going to go up. So uh, which way prices? Well, based on this very simple statistical relationship, the green line is, the, is, is the, uh, what the, the equation uh, predicts. 
So between 2011 and 2036, that little equation predicts a 75% increase in, in the median sale price. And, uh, you know, it has some relationship to the red line, obviously. Uh, I, I think it's going to be off. I think it'll be wrong. My prediction is it'll be higher. What other factors haven't we taken into account? Well, this is just, I mean, obviously just a, a simply one, one variable regression equation. I mean, demand and supply are complicated. You know, there are a lot of demand factors to take into account. Uh, and on the supply side, what about the cost of labor and materials? It's not in here, right? Uh, what about the development cost? The further out you go into the urban fringe, the typically the more expensive it is to provide services. The price of land usually rises the further out you go. Uh, so, and that, of course, is being captured by this, uh, this equation here. Uh, I think it'll, it'll be a double. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, that that it'll, it'll be that high. How will people accommodate these high prices? I mean, affordability will only worsen. So, you know, uh, right now in Vancouver, Metro Vancouver, 65% of households are owners, 35% are renters. In 25 years, I predict it'll be less than 60% owners and more than 40% renters. Another way, uh, so there'll be relatively more renters, is that people will double up. Households will actually uh, probably increase. There will be multifamily households. We're beginning to see that in some of the census numbers already. Uh, been, uh, you know, granted, you start, when you start from a small base, it really increases quickly percentage-wise. Um, so they, they could even be intergenerational, where you have these, what we used to be in the old days, extended households to accommodate, to, to basically do, to, to meet the affordability uh, crunch. So households will have to make all these adjustments over time. We'll, of course, we'll densify. We'll be living in maybe uh, 300 square foot apartments. Some, not all of us, some of us will, right? So densification, we're definitely going up. No doubt about that. Uh, and it is, this will happen in other parts as well. This will happen in Toronto, in Calgary. Uh, densification will occur. Granted, in Calgary, they'll just keep growing at some. But at some point, the you know the the the, the rate of expansion will slow. Uh, and it's just the nature. I mean, the, we look at the global population. It's now at seven billion, predicted to top out somewhere between what nine and ten. That's still a lot more people, right? Uh, and uh, as at last I looked, uh, the world isn't getting any bigger either. So what do you th which way do you think uh, uh, those prices, land prices might go? So when you, when you think about it, uh, uh, you know, when you get beyond the simple price to income measure and say, oh gosh, you know, price income is way up here. Uh, you know, in the last 30 years it was down here. Surely it must come down to this. No, <laughs> there's no surely about it at all. <laughs> you know, that's naivety, quite frankly. You know, it's not, it's just a superficial and incomplete analysis. And I've seen it so many times uh, that, and people buy into it, you know, and even policymakers buy into it. You know, I can go on about the, the latest moves that the finance minister has made, uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, narrowing, reducing the amortization period the last uh, couple of times, uh, uh, even uh, this last mortgage rate uh, deal, you know, I mean, my goodness, you know, people are, uh, uh, I think, really, don't really get a good sense of you know, why the housing market is what it is. You know, I think for the most part, housing prices are fairly valued. Yes, there are times when, when markets go to excess. That happens in, in housing markets at times. It happens in equity markets, commodity markets, for sure. Uh, and there are corrections. There's, there's a housing cycle as well. It's not all going to be a straight line like this. Uh, there will be these ups and downs. Uh, I don't know what the next calamity might be or the next crisis. Uh, and even if there isn't, there, are, there will be an ebb and flow to the uh, business cycle. You know, uh, hopefully not severe like we had in 2008-9. That is some, that's a shock event. You know, there could be a geopolitical event to uh, play out, uh, maybe an environmental disaster. Who knows uh, what could happen uh, in, in the next. Uh, but, uh, you know, as that aside, uh, uh, you know, we will be facing, you know, considerably higher prices. Uh, and high, high land prices did, are really, a, did, uh, you know, determine, uh, defer our, our detriment to economic growth. Right, they they reduce uh, the you know if we had lower uh, prices in Vancouver, BC, we would have more economic growth. We'd have more people here, more businesses here. 
you know, uh, people in businesses sometimes tend to leave because costs are high, rents are high, taxes are high, uh, labor has to, you know, has to have a place to, to live. And if that's too expensive, then some labor may not. So, and so it goes. So uh, that, that's a contributing factor to, to, to uh, you know, our economic reforms. And the BC is what, 95% mountainous. Look at your valley. Which way are you going to grow? North and south. You're, you can only go so high up the mountain. In Vancouver, it's, it's what, 1,200 feet, I think. Unless you start you know, making major pumping stations. Right? <laughs> so there are limits. And uh, uh, you know, that's just the nature of our geography right? uh, that uh, we have to deal with. And, uh, and in some ways, it's an advantage. And some of these mountains contain a lot of resources. <laughs> so that's the good news. right? Uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, inhabitation and urban development, it's uh, much more costly. So uh, uh, I think I've lectured you enough on housing. <laughs> I didn't, don't mean to, but uh, uh, it's one of those things, that, one of my pet peeves. Uh, uh, I just think the supply side is underappreciated. Uh, I should probably uh, close with my slide. You know, it's the, most of the focus is on these price to income ratios, uh, and then they stop there, and then, the, and then they, that, that leads them to certain conclusions and policy responses. But really, uh, you know, it, it's like any market, demand and supply come into play, and it's, it's complex. Uh, you know, as economists, we try to simplify things uh, um, as, so that we can understand it, I can understand it, but uh, uh, it's, it's even there, you know, it's more complex than even one person can, can, uh, can really uh, imagine. Uh, and uh, as I said before, uh, affordability will only worsen over time, and, uh, but it will also worsen other, in other jurisdictions as well, so we won't be alone, but obviously uh, uh, in, uh, in some parts of BC it will be even more severe. Yeah. Yeah. I believe you speechless. <laughs> Can we open it up for Absolutely. Questions? Absolutely. I think I'm done.